Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's great to be back here at Michigan. I am an alumni of the program and of the training grant and uh, had a lot of support from the folks in the department and it's really good to see a lot of familiar faces both in the audience now and throughout the day. Um, so I, I really appreciated that. <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure whose plan it was to have me speaking at around four or five o'clock on a Friday, um, but this is uh, the slot that I'm in. So um, it's going to be a little bit different than the talks that you've just heard. Um, this is more of the career talk. Um, sort of bringing up some ideas of things that you can be thinking about and where you might want to um, focus and head and uh, introduce you to some unique career opportunities that maybe uh, you hadn't uh, seen previously. Okay, so to tie it into the um, theme of the conference, uh, ontogeny, uh, and that is the origin and development of the individual organism from uh, embryo to adult. And uh, really, what is your individual uh, career ontogeny? I, I know I'm taking a little bit of liberty here in the, the meaning, um, but it was the best way that I could sort of um, draw that path or that line and uh, look at um, each stage in your development uh, as you're moving through your career. <clears throat> and I'm going to be using my personal experience um, because I think I, I've had a, a fairly unique experience in order to uh, sort of introduce you to some of these um, unique ideas. And so we'll, we'll follow this sort of yellow or maize and blue line uh, that I've created uh, in order to, to reach those goals. I'd like to start by giving a little background and perspective because everybody's development starts with um, where their background is and what sets them on the path uh, that they're on to become an adult. And I started at the University of Virginia for undergrad. And uh, in my senior year, I had an opportunity uh, to do senior research with Dr. Michael Meneker. He was um, quite a mentor. I want to take this opportunity to really say that you'll see a theme throughout my talk. And that is that there are great mentors at each phase in your career. And it's really those people who can help direct you into and give you guidance into what may be the next step or to help you think through what the next great step in your career might be. Um, Dr. Michael Meneker is a circadian rhythm biologist. And actually I'd go so, so far as to say he is the circadian rhythm biologist. He's a, uh, the father of the field. He was in the lab when the idea was even proposed. Since then, he brought the uh, National Science Foundation Center for Biological Timing to the University of Virginia, had it there for the extent that you can have one of these centers, and uh, was very impactful on me. And it was the first time that I really saw the way in which science is conducted at a professional level, as opposed to science from a didactic perspective. And uh, I. I I would venture to say that um, his influence in that was one of the reasons why I pursued uh, a career in science while getting my biology degree at Virginia. I then moved out to Oklahoma, which was uh, really a career choice that was um, focused on uh, a job. I had an opportunity to join an environmental consulting firm. And I got to see the industry side of environmental consulting. While I was there, I, I thought it was a good idea. Uh, my, the vice president to whom I reported um, was adjunct faculty at Oklahoma State. And so I said, why not continue my education and really find um, a nice balance between uh, working life and uh, uh, continuing that, that educational process. And so I got a degree in environmental toxicology. And that really opened the door to the next stage where I became an, or a, an uh, amphibian endocrinologist. What I did was I looked at um, you know, the impact and effects of chemicals on uh, the metamorphic process in uh, a frog. <clears throat> it's a great model system. It's a, it's a sentinel species because the thyroid hormone system in a frog is just like yours or mine. Um, but metamorphosis is 100% dependent on um, the thyroid hormone action. 
So after completing my degree there and being quite a ways from home, I'm from the East Coast, I decided to come back. And I had an opportunity to move on to a, a job in government. Uh, the U.S. Army Center for Environmental Health Research uh, is located on Fort Detrick in uh, Frederick, Maryland. And I went there um, in an effort to begin developing um, some assays to identify endocrine disrupting chemicals based on some congressional legislation that said we needed to begin looking at, at this more seriously. <clears throat> and I had a master's degree and, and I understood the process of developing assays and things, but I really started to learn how it fit into the greater picture of science. <clears throat> but while I was there, I also understood that I'd never be able to really develop my own science with a master's degree working in a government lab. Uh, what I could do was be part of a, a, an important team. And I saw how I can make contributions, but I decided I wanted to take it another step further. And uh, at that time, I decided to look for some of the, the best amphibian endocrinologists I could find, and one happened to be here at Michigan. Um, and so that's how I made it, made it up to Michigan. And I, I came to the Department of Molecular Cellular Developmental Biology, um, where I started to study TSH in the brain of a frog that doesn't even live in the US. And I said, I'm focusing on a 21 amino acid peptide. How is that really making a difference? What I wanted to do was really be able to make a difference. It incrementally moves a field forward that's very important. And that's a, a great endeavor, but it's not the one that I wanted to choose. And so uh, I transferred over here to the School of Public Health, where I found another great mentor. And if you don't recognize her, this is Dr. Locke Caruso. And I'd like to take this as my first lecture back here at Michigan since leaving um, to, to really thank her for the guidance and the mentorship that she really provided to me um, which has uh, absolutely benefited me in everything else you're going to see here today um, because it really set me on a path uh, to be able to be successful um, through that, that well-grounded education. So that brings us up to um, August of 2009 when I defended and was ready to head out into the real world. Um, from talking to Justin and other students, it, it seems that every one of you are going to have to do that at some point. <laughs> Maybe not today. Uh, I, I was actually surprised to see how, just how many of the um, folks that I know who are within six months of graduation. Uh, there's a lot of you right now. And, uh, and one of the um, real choices you're going to have to face is do I go to industry? And, you know, I had an industry experience. I was, you know, an environmental consulting firm. I knew a little bit about what that is. And there are great opportunities there to do real impactful science, uh, both at the bench, uh, theoretical, computer-based, um, you name it. Or do I go to academia? And I'd been in school, uh, I guess, between a bachelor's, two masters, and a doctorate at that point for a little over a decade. And so I thought I understood the uh, academia route fairly well and what was involved in that. And if I wanted to be a PI, for instance, and writing grants and pursuing uh, that avenue, which is also a great opportunity to move a field forward, be impactful to human health. Um, and then I had another choice. I could go into government. What I did uh, was I chose a route that went through the public health service. So um, I'm here in uniform, and this isn't the Navy uniform. This is very much like the one um, uh, Tom Cruise, you know, would wear. But this isn't it. This is the public health service. Um, it's the only uniformed uh, service in the world with the sole focus of promoting health and wellness. <clears throat> How did I get introduced to it? 
I was here just like you when, oh, thank you again for both of your talks. No, no worries at all. So, <laughs> it was that bad. I don't think they need the career advice at this point. We do have jobs, I guess, right? <laughs> at least today. At least for now. So I was here at Michigan, and uh, a speaker came in and gave a little job talk. And it was um, Rear Admiral Shaker, who worked at the CDC and uh, was in the public health service. And he was a Michigan uh, alumni who came up and said, I want to at least give people an idea of what's going on with the public health service, who we are. Um, who in this room has heard of the public health service before me? So less than a quarter. That's not real surprising. Um, <clears throat> and so each stop along our path, I'm going to give you a little background about the organization. I'm going to give you an idea of what some of the roles are and, and what some of the opportunities are. And then I'm going to give you some personal experiences that I've had there that gives you a firsthand account of what, um, what may lie out there and, and what you could potentially pursue. Uh, so our mission is to protect, promote, and advance the public health and safety of our nation. Um, that sounds, in a nutshell, very neat, um, but it's actually very complex. Um, how most people uh, understand us best is we are the uniformed service that uh, is overseen by the Surgeon General of the United States. That's currently acting um, Surgeon General Rear Admiral Boris Lushniak. Um, who is America's chief health educator. Um, <clears throat> it's his job to get out there and, and really educate the public uh, more so than the scientists. And uh, I've also included uh, President Obama's nominee, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Uh, uh, he has been nominated for the 19th U.S. Surgeon General, and he's actually a very interesting pick. Um, he's 36 years old, a business entrepreneur, and uh, very, not what you would traditionally see um, in the role of the U.S. Surgeon General. We're about 6,600 officers um, in various roles. And um, the first thing I want to get across here is that the U.S. Public Health Service is not a job. It's um, a way. Uh, it's in the first part, a human resources system and a way to take a federal position. Um, <clears throat> the uniformed officers of the Public Health Service are in, uh, I believe, over 40 different agencies and institutes of the U.S. government in more than um, 10 of the departments. And so we're sort of infiltrated everywhere. And, and we'll get to that a little bit more later in the opportunities. Um, we consist of 11 categories of officers, ranging from physicians and dentists and nurses and those uh, professional clinicians. Um, but I've highlighted some of the categories here that you might be most interested in. The scientists category, the environmental health officers category, and the health services officers category. And those, if you're looking this up offline, if you get inspired in some way, those are some of the ones you might want to focus on a little bit more and, and start your investigation. Now what we do, um, as I said, we're, it's a wide range of um, professional occupations, if you will, 11 different categories. And so the range of what we do is very wide as well. And these are very broad descriptions. Uh, and I understand that. So, Really, it's um, many of the positions that you would look for in a government agency are things that potentially could be done as a public health service officer if you chose that route, as opposed to a GS civil servant. Here are a small selection of the institutes and agencies uh, in which public health service officers serve. Um, <clears throat> the two I'll be... Oh, hmm, I didn't realize this was even on here. There we go. The two that I'll be uh, speaking about most today are the NIEHS and the US EPA. 
um, but we are uh, throughout the government, CDC and APSDR obviously are our big areas, as is um, the FDA, because the Public Health Service is actually located in the Department of Health and Human Services, as are these um, agencies. Where can you do this work? Just about anywhere. Um, I don't know where your hometown is, but uh, chances are there's a public health service officer serving not far uh, from where you are. <clears throat> so I've talked to you a little bit about the first half where the public health service is a way of taking a federal position. Um, but there's also a second half of the job of being a public health service officer. It isn't just about putting on a uniform, going and doing your job, coming home and taking it off. You're actually a 24-7 asset of the U.S. government. And where that comes in and has its greatest impact is in the response to emergency and humanitarian response efforts. And uh, a little hard from back there. But these are three examples of recent um, missions where the U.S. Public Health Service was deployed in order to help um, uh, folks in need. And uh, the first is uh, uh, the USS Comfort, which is a naval ship um, that does humanitarian missions. Um, I think uh, they do primarily South and Central America. Uh, I'm not sure if it was one of the uh, ships sent over actually to the Philippines um, more recently. Um, Deepwater Horizon is uh, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you all have all the background you need on on Deepwater Horizon. Uh, we played an integral role there, <clears throat> and I'll talk more about that in my personal experience. And then a uh, picture on the end here, um, the hurricane that came through Haiti uh, was one that uh, we specifically identified um, officers who uh, were verbally competent to be able to go over and to help in the relief efforts, uh, as you can see um, in this photo. So now, um, I myself, uh, when I joined the Public Health Service, joined one of the Rapid Deployment Forces. And what that is, is a um, group of approximately 100 to 120 uh, uniformed officers who in about 12 hours can be on the ground anywhere in the country in response to a uh, health emergency or natural disaster. And uh, in training for that um, uh, role, uh, we, we shifted from a mock type of training to a hands-on training that would provide those services uh, and medical care to underserved communities throughout the U.S. And so, um, in my experience, I had the opportunity to lead a small group um, down in the border region of Texas, uh, providing health care to 2,200 um, underserved individuals uh, who, who did not have access to care. What we did was took the team in and set up a uh, field medical station in a local high school and brought in the public to actually help us to train and we would in turn provide the access to care that they you know, so desperately needed. Um, <clears throat> another example of a, a deployment that I had was actually with Deepwater Horizon. Uh, the chief medical officer for the Deepwater Horizon uh, event was Rear Admiral Galloway of the U.S. Public Health Service. And he was uh, stationed in two doors down from Thad Allen's office and uh, worked day to day with those Coast Guard teams and those local teams to be able to make sure that things like uh, seafood safety and those issues were properly addressed in the aftermath of that disaster. I had the opportunity to serve with Rear Admiral Galloway as his special assistant or executive officer. And uh, that was really a unique opportunity for me to be able to go and serve in a, a real life, live, hands-on operation. And uh, really, I think this aspect of the public health service is um, more rewarding even than my day-to-day -day job uh, from my perspective. And now this isn't a recruiting talk, but I did want to drop a couple slides in um, just because it's being recorded and if people want to go back and uh, 
look at some of these opportunities. Um, there are Commission Corps officer student training and extern opportunities um, from the time that you're still in school. This provides stipends, this provides um, internship and learning opportunities. Um, I encourage you to look into these if you have an interest in perhaps wanting to serve in the public health service after graduation. Uh, this gives you a nice jump and a head start on time in service and all of those other benefit generating um, good things. And then finally where you can find more information. Um, I'll leave that up for a moment. Okay, I'm going to take my first quick break. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, more than you would expect. In some of the disciplines, there is uh, definitely a um, sign-on bonuses uh, and money tied to going to underserved areas, tribal nations, those sorts of things in the Indian Health Service. But for most of you, and as it would apply to this talk, you have complete control over that. Um, because most of you would be going in as scientists or environmental health officers, and there's not, your, your pay is your pay, and you are not uh, firmly tied or committed to the service. Since you can, you can leave the service at any time. There's not a commitment. Um, and you can choose the job that you want to take a federal position as a public health service officer. Yes, ma'am. Yep. It looks like the deadline was December 31st, like two weeks ago. Um, do you know For the COSTEP program, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the COSTEP program has more of a firm deadline because it's on a yearly cycle, whereas the application for the public health service is uh, rolling, although certain categories um, may open and close at different times based on the needs of the service itself. Okay. One more oh, yes, ma'am. The priorities, I would say, come down from both our internal leadership and the leadership of the agencies and institutes in which we serve. Um, because you have to remember that we're really there to meet their mission. We are an asset that they use to, to address um, uh, their, their goals. So you're more tied to the organization, you work for than the other? Yes. Uh, but we do have one meeting each year in which public health service officers come together. Yes, ma'am. I think that's an important distinguishing point. Um, if you versus the industry path uh, or the academia path, if I'm right, if you go the government path, I think you have to understand that what gets funded is influenced by who's sitting in the White House and what their priorities are. I just think that's, am I, am I right? I mean, is that your experience? Uh, absolutely, and I think that's going, to, and that's going to come out quite clearly in a lot of the the other agency initiatives as well. Um, but we are public health service isn't immune to that in any way. And really, the Surgeon General is an appointed position, and so the direction of our leadership is coming down from an appointed um, uh, leader of the public health service, as opposed to necessarily a career officer who would have come up through the public health service. And so they're appointed by the president. For those of us who are interested in the public health service, I was a PhD, and I've never done a postdoc. And how common is that? Um, fairly. And uh, it's more common that you do a postdoc if your end goal is to be a bench researcher or a um, intramural program researcher. 
and that's very common. But there are a lot of roles in government for uh, master students and PhD students that are not bench scientists and are not in a laboratory per se setting. And uh, some of those are, are some of the opportunities we're, we're just about to get to. Okay, so I told you that it's not a job. You get um, approved for commissioning, but then you need to go out and find yourself a job. And so the first place and, and where I thought I wanted to work was the US EPA. And so I applied for a couple positions there and uh, interviewed, and fortunately enough, um, I, uh, I was offered. So very quickly about the US EPA's organization. And I'm not sure at what level to, uh, to present this, because I know that there are undergrads here, there are grad students here, there are postdocs here, there are faculty here, and uh, there's a wide range of understanding. So this may be a little below some of you, a little above some of you. Um, <clears throat> the US EPA is uh, led by an administrator who is appointed by the president. So again, we see where politics may be driving some of the senior leadership and decisions of an agency um, and its mission. Um, the US EPA has uh, program offices, for instance, air, water, and uh, OSWER, the solid waste and emergency response, or land. It has chemical safety for, and pollution prevention, which is, has pesticide programs and some of those um, under it, as well as in, uh, enforcement and compliance. That's a big one. That shows you EPA is a regulatory agency. Uh, and that's very important in its culture. Um, what you're doing is actually regulating industries and what people can and can't do. And that is oftentimes a very touchy um, uh, issue. Uh, there's tribal affairs and there's resource management. Um, and then there are regional offices. So there are 10 regional offices across the US which also have opportunities. Um, and those regional offices are the ones who really get in touch with their local area and make sure that what we're doing is in keeping with the ideas and the needs of the, of the, the entire country and not just Washington, D.C. or Research Triangle Park or Cincinnati. Now, I've highlighted these two in the middle um, because these are the two I'll be talking about most. The first is... Um, the assistant uh, or the Office of Environmental Information. And you wouldn't think of that as some place that a scientist would go unless it was a computer scientist. That's actually where I started my career at the US EPA. What these two offices have in common is that they're both um, support offices for the rest of the agency. And in being the environmental information provides support in uh, making data accessible and big data and data science and some of those issues, while research and development does a lot of the research that supports the decision making in the program offices. So now to get back on our maize and blue path, I joined the Office of Environmental Information. And uh, I, in that, I joined the Toxics Release Inventory. So in 1984, in Bhopal, India, there was a, a huge disaster at a Union Carbide plant where 20,000 um, people were killed by a release of methyl isocyanate. And that really opened a lot of people's eyes. What's being stored in our neighborhoods? What's being stored in residential areas? And uh, in 1986, there was a legislation passed EPGRA 313, um, or the EPGRA, EPGRA uh, which was the Emergency Preparedness and Community Right to Know Act. And what that did was, uh, among other things for emergency preparedness, it established the Toxics Release Inventory that said neighborhoods have a right to know what chemicals are being released into it. Um, and the individuals there have a, have a right to know what industry is doing in and around where they live. And so the Toxics Release Inventory um, regulates industries of certain sizes in certain sectors. And of course, there's a lot of 
Washington legally is written into any le legislation, but what, it, what it's meaning to do is to track chemicals that have been identified as toxic and uh, when and how they're, they make it outside <coughs> the walls of a facility. <clears throat> they needed a toxicologist to evaluate chemicals um, to identify whether or not they're hazardous, whether they should be on this list or whether they don't need to be on this list. And that's the first uh, position that I took. And so for the chem folks in here, this was one of the biggest ones that I worked on. This is acetonitrile. And uh, it was a chemical that we were being petitioned to take off of the list because of lack of information behind it. Um, because when the short-term toxicity assays were done and the long-term uh, two-year tox assays were done, the dose levels that were selected um, missed a decent portion of where possible effects would have been seen. And so in going back through and reviewing all the available literature and putting together pieces of dose response curves, it's actually able to uh, um, make a justifiable case for keeping acetonitrile on the toxics release inventory um, and, and really learned uh, the process. In the nine years prior to joining the TRI program, I had, uh, there had been no new chemicals added. That happened to coincide with the Bush era um, administration. Uh, in my first year there, uh, I reviewed and added 17 chemicals. Um, but I got to work on some other really neat things too. And this is actually a mobile app that I was on the team that developed. And, and it gave me a great opportunity to really apply some of the, the skills and ideas and thoughts that I had into the next generation world. And one of the things we did was made this mobile app so you could pull up right on your phone. Where am I? What types of facilities are around me that need to be reporting into the TRI program or some of the other reporting databases we incorporated as well? And so now you can still download this onto your phone and, uh, and look at what's in my neighborhood. Um, what chemicals are being released from this facility or that facility? Or I smelled gas the other, you know, grandmas and things. I smelled bad fumes coming out of that factory. What was it? You know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> then after serving there for two years, um, I saw an opportunity to move on to the Office of Research and Development. And it was an opportunity that I, I couldn't really pass up because after being in Office of uh, Environmental Information, I got to see where a lot of the research was being done and a lot of the science was being done in the EPA. And ORD is really where it was focused. And so I, I kind of wanted to get in there, and, uh, and I ended up having a great opportunity. So quickly, the Office of Research and Development, as I said previously, supports the program offices with research to which they can use to support their policies, regulations, and congressional mandates. In addition, it supports the regional offices with scientific expertise and scientific liaisons. And all of those work toward EPA's mission to protect human health and the environment. Uh, just a quick idea to give you a size and scope. Um, I don't think any of this is proprietary, at least I hope not. Um, so it's just under 2,000 people. Uh, in 2012, sorry for the datedness of the, some of these slides, this is about um, uh, the most recent information I had but a fairly sizable budget. You're looking at uh, just under 600 million. And they have 13 labs and research facilities across the US. And uh, keep that in mind when you're thinking about, is this something I'd like to go into? It's not just Washington, DC. Um, the EPA is, is in really quite a, quite a number of places. And at the time I was there, we had uh, an assistant administrator who was also an appointed person through by the administrator. So there's a little bit more of your politics leaking into your various um, <clears throat> programs. Um, but Paul Anastas, father of green chemistry, 
really changed uh, some of the culture and direction that the EPA's Office of Research and Development was focused on. And his goal was really sustainability, or um, providing for our needs today without impacting the potential for uh, the next generation to be, to be able to provide for their own needs. It's not using, um, using nature's interest as opposed to its capital, uh, is, is another way of thinking about that. <clears throat> And he restructured uh, a lot of ORD's programs. And this is just to give you an idea so that if and when you would look into the EPA as a potential career path, um, these are the uh, six national programs that were established. Um, air, climate and energy, safe and sustainable water, chemical safety, homeland security, sustainable and healthy communities, and human health risk assessment. And you can really see that sustainability and the idea of being able to um, use the resources in the physical environment um, to be able to support our communities and research and uh, industry without depleting those resources to which we're using. And uh, each of these cross-cutting national programs then got support from the ORD lab centers and offices. And, uh, I don't think I'm going to spend a lot of time on these. About how much time do I have? Um, eight minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so we have the National Center for Computational Toxicology, uh, and and actually you can you can read through these. And uh, if what you're looking to do is bench science, I would recommend you look into some of these national centers. Uh, I mean, I call it bench science, computational toxicology. It's, sitting at the computer as opposed to the bench, but you're still looking at things in a, a very high throughput um, way, some of those sorts of things. Ron Hines, who we heard about in our last talk quite extensively with his research being shown, is now the deputy director of NHER. Uh, so he has moved from Minnesota, and he's now an EPA. Oh, yeah, sorry, Wisconsin. Um, and then uh, we have some, some of our other offices listed there as well. And so what did I do there? I, I told you I had a great opportunity that came up. And there was a detail, which a detail is just a short-term trial period to be able to go and do a job before somebody um, really decides on how to fill that position. I kind of look at it as the dating phase before you get married. <laughs> and you really have an opportunity to, to see if it's a good fit for you and they can see if it's a good fit for them. And so it's really as beneficial to the applicant as it is to the, uh, the office. And uh, this is the next mentor I wanted to point out. This is uh, Dr. Kevin Teichman. He was the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Science under Paul Anastas. And so he's the career EPA employee who was directly under and advising the Assistant Administrator who gets to make all the big decisions. He was by training an engineer and decided for his special assistant um, to, to get a specific scientific special assistant with more of a tox biology background and I fit the bill. Um, so after interviewing um, he, I was selected for the position and uh, some of the things that I did uh, and this was taken out of the, the job description itself, um, but really provided technical advice on everything that came through his office. And so it's a lot of reading briefs, it's a lot of talking with people to get the backstory, to make sure that he has the information he needs to be able to make quality recommendations to the assistant administrator. I've uh, noted three important um, uh, programs that I got to work on directly uh, hands-on. The first was the hiring of the national program directors, uh, those six national pro cross-cutting programs. I got to manage the process of hiring those folks, putting together a panel of expert, external experts to be able to review all the uh, applicants for those positions, and then um, walk through the process of, of hiring. And if you think about having an impact on human health and the environment, who sits in those seats are hugely impactful. Um, and so thereby 
at that early stage in my career, had an opportunity to really um, have an impact on ORDs looking into the future. I also worked on a scientific integrity policy. Um, scientific integrity uh, policies were mandated for all the executive branch agencies by the president. He said, we need to address this um, firmly and fully. What can scientists talk about? And finally, I worked on a non-monotonic dose response state of science paper. This is a highly contentious area. I don't think I have a lot of time to go into it, um, but we put together a draft, um, uh, a draft analysis of the state of science. And I actually got to be the chair of the working group that put this together. On that working group are the absolute experts in the field from the EPA, the FDA, and NIEHS. Included in that is the Associate Director of the National Toxicology Program. You know, folks like that, and get to, get to put together a meaningful piece of scientific um, evaluation that's now being reviewed by the NRC. And uh, I, you know, I certainly didn't control what information went into it, really the process and, and was able to contribute my own ideas as well as we went and um, I'm sure Dr. Meekers and Dr. Locke Crusoe are eagerly looking to see uh, what comes out of this. Um, and um, I need to, I just for time, need to skip what non-monotonic dose responses are, but uh, <clears throat> these were the only two data graphs in my whole talk. So. <laughs> After the last talk, I, I thought maybe we'll take it a step down. Uh, and so moving along our maize and blue path, uh, after serving there for another year and a half, two years or so, I got an opportunity with the National Institutes of Health. Um, I think due to time, I'm going to move through this a little more quickly, uh, just to be able to leave a little bit uh, more time at the end rather than invite questions again on EPA now. We'll save those till the end. Uh, so this is a picture of the campus in Bethesda, Maryland, where uh, the majority of the institutes uh, that make up the National Institutes of Health are located. This is an enormous campus. I think it's over 300 acres. And uh, it's um, probably the uh, uh, greatest uh, research institute for health in the world. Um, there's, there's really, I would say, no comparison. <clears throat> its mission, uh, to undercover new knowledge that will lead to better health for everyone. It has a substantial budget. As of a week ago or so, we all found out that it has a budget of $29.9 billion. How is that budget broken up? Uh, we can see research grants. This is what's known as an extramural program, and this is what both of our speakers who uh, spoke previously today, they both talked about money that came out of this pool. Um, there are also intramural research. Uh, this is actual bench science done at the National Institutes, um, where the research is done hands-on right there, as opposed to the money going out to academic universities or institutes or small businesses. Um, this is the internal research that's done. So I bring this up because there are opportunities for um, uh, scientists in both of these programs. It's not just the hands-on at the bench pro, uh, where scientists can have uh, or, you know, MPH um, opportunities, but also in reviewing and establishing the programs that uh, manage these grants. Um, so keep in mind that there are, all, there are many different ways within the NIH to get involved uh, or to, to join the team. Very quickly, uh, this is what the makeup of the NIH looks like, and the only one I'm going to comment on, because it probably applies most to this audience, is the biggest number on here is po postdoctoral fellows. How do they get their work done? How do they actually do their research? This is a huge number of folks, 
and there are a, a lot of training, uh, postdoctoral training opportunities at the NIH that I would um, um, encourage you to pursue if, uh, if bench science is something you are interested in. I'm going to skip the key elements and move on to uh, these are the 27 institutes that make up the National Institutes of Health, all surrounded by Dr. Collins' Office of the Director. And the opportunity that I had with the NIH was in the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is the one that is not headquartered at Bethesda. There are locations for some of the other institutes around the U.S., um, but they're all headquartered in Bethesda other than the NIEHS. <clears throat> it's in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Its mission is to discover how the environment affects people in order to promote healthier lives. It's the only one that's looking at the environmental contributions to health. Many of the others are looking at children's health, aging, uh, addiction, those sorts of things. Uh, specific diseases like cancers, the, uh, probably I think it's the biggest. Um, we look at the way in which environment contributes to human health in general. Why should we be concerned? Well, because these increases in adverse um, outcomes uh, that we see over relatively short periods of time can't be attributable to genetics. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, we don't see genetic drift since 1980 or since 1990. And so it's something in our environment that is potentially interacting with our genetics or interacting with our systems that uh, lead to these adverse outcomes. Our environment includes everything around us. Dust, air, food, prescription drugs, social, social and economic factors. <clears throat> there are many diseases that are covered in the potential for adverse outcomes um, due to environmental impacts, uh, including many of those listed here, but this is only a small subset. This isn't a uh, exhaustive list. Under the current director, uh, there's been a conceptual shift at NIEHS as well. Um, <clears throat> it used to be that people thought about um, chemicals as acting by breaking down or overwhelming uh, the body's ability to maintain homeostasis and health. Um, whereas now we're looking that chemicals can also act like hormones and drugs to disrupt uh, pathways um, well upstream of the adverse outcome that's being looked at. Um, and it can happen at very low doses um, and in <clears throat> uh, susceptible populations. And some of those windows of susceptibility are uh, during development. Air contaminants, for instance, may be affecting um, children or newborns very differently, as we, we saw in our last talk. I'm, I'm trying to move through a little bit more quickly because I'd like to get you guys out of here on time on a Friday. Um, lifelong effects can also be uh, have origins in gestation. Uh, there may be midlife or late life effects that were set in motion um, in the womb. And uh, Michigan actually has some researchers uh, working very closely on, on these types of issues. Um, these all are, are meant to give you an idea of the types of things that the NIEHS is focused on looking at and thereby giving you an idea of perhaps what some of the opportunities um, for scientific researchers uh, are at at the NIEHS. Um, many, there are many different estimations. A lot of people say there are 80,000 chemicals in commerce, of which really though 15,000 make it outside of a manufacturing process 
or uh, potentially have a, a level of exposure which would make them an environmental concern. Um, most of these have little or no data, as I'm sure this group is aware. Um, <clears throat> and how do we go about identifying what the hazard uh, or the risk associated with these chemicals are? The NIEHS also houses uh, the National Toxicology Program. And the National Toxicology Program um, is uh, firmly committed, uh, as, as was laid out in this um, paper by uh, Dr. Collins, uh, the director of the NIHS, um, Dr. Gray, who was a previous uh, assistant administrator at the EPA, who's now, I believe, at uh, Was uh, George Washington, and uh, Dr. John Booker, who is the associate director of the uh, NTP. And what the idea is here um, is that by looking um, at high throughput critical toxicity pathways uh, and using computational toxicology approaches, we can better predict and prioritize which chemicals should make it into um, a more closely um, a better look at what their toxicity or adverse impact might be in rodent and thereby be able to better predict uh, human impacts. And so the idea is that we can't run uh, mouse or rat studies on 15,000 chemicals. It's just cost prohibitive, time prohibitive. How do we look at uh, toxicity pathways uh, as opposed to just specific points in order to identify um, and predict or better predict what a chemical's uh, impact might be. And that's really the direction the National Toxicology Program is going and it has both uh, at the bench researchers um, <clears throat> and, and quite a few opportunities there as well. The opportunity I have uh, currently is as Chief of Staff in the Office of the Director. Uh, and this is the last mentor I'll talk about today. Uh, this is Dr. Linda Birnbaum. Uh, my time here, I work extensively on flame retardants and endocrine disruptors, and so my fit in her office is, um, is quite nice. Um, she has been working on flame retardants and endocrine disruptors uh, since I wore short pants. And, uh, um, and really a lot of her papers were things that I was reading at the time here at Michigan. <clears throat> a lot of people ask, what do I do? Um, I had a list of about 13 different um, roles and responsibilities in my position description uh, when, I, when I took this position. The one that I would say is the most important and gets used the most is other duties as assigned. Really what it is, is being able to support um, the, the NIEHS in a way that acts as a liaison with the director who spends, I don't know, gives 60 to 70 talks a year uh, around the U.S. and around the world. Um, and what do people do when she's not there? Uh, I'm a liaison. But I also provide insight and I'm able to coordinate and present um, a lot of the alternatives for her to be able to make decisions on. And it's an opportunity for me to really um, better understand that uh, merger of science and policy and science administration. Um, that's really the direction that I see my career going. If you think about the EPA, going from being a staff toxicologist to a special assistant in the office of the deputy assistant administrator, and starting to sit on that edge um, of decision makers and scientists. Scientists don't speak policy. Policy folks don't speak science. And you really need somebody in that to make sure that science is driving the best decisions possible. And so, um, a lot of what I do day to day uh, could be human resources. It could be addressing issues with the, um, the daycare. It could be addressing issues of a scientific nature. It could be developing one of the, the most recent um, projects that I've been working on is the hiring of a 
um, scientific information officer. Instead of a CIO, which we have one of already, we need an SIO, somebody who's looking at scientific computing, somebody who's looking at data analysis to be able to get more out of the information we're generating. And so right now, we're, um, I'm working with others there at the Institute to be able to define the role of that position uh, more fully uh, so that we can make sure that the person we bring in is going to fit our culture, is going to fit our needs, and is going to be able to um, move our Institute in the right direction. So now I'd like to thank you. Uh, that was a, a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but I have all the time you need to sit and answer questions um, that you might have. We have one. The hiring process. You can still work there, but there are limitations. I'm not an HR expert, um, but I do know that many of our, our positions and many of our folks there are not U.S. citizens. So there are avenues to be able to, to move into scientific careers. So if you're foreign-born but have the citizenship or a green card, that loosens up the um, certainly don't quote me, but I don't think there would be any real restrictions at that point. Okay. Any other questions? Um, sure, we'll start over here. Do a training. I feel a little bit bad about the earlier comment when I was kind of pointing out how what the government is driven by the executive office. Mm -hmm. because it made it sound uh, not negative. And I, I just wanted to balance that out with pointing out when you talked in those earlier talks were about dose response and, and, and dose was just like this huge focus. And if you think about impact to um, health, right, the clinician sees the individual, the public health sees a population, right, an entire population. And one of the biggest things when we measure impact to health is actually policy. So it's that translation of science to policy. And so I just wanted to thank you for, for pointing that out. And I, I just was trying to balance the, well, you know, you struggle with some of the negatives of being constrained by uh, an executive branch. You also have the benefit of being able to implement national policy. Yeah, I, that, that's a great point. And it's equally important to point out that the science that um, should drive the policy and not vice versa. And that's what one of the really important things about that scientific integrity policy that I was talking about really gets to the root of. The science should be the science, the science. Policy should not be in any way influencing that direction. It should be single directional um, influence that the decisions and the policies should be based on the best science available to the decision -makers. Let's say we find that substance A, arsenic, has toxicity associated with it. Um, then that is the science that drives. At such and such a level, we see these adverse effects. That then gets taken, and it's not the scientist's job to then do anything with that information. It's the policymakers to say, you know, the science says that arsenic is bad for a risk down to some very low level. But they also have to weigh in, 
is it feasible to clean up every Superfund site to that level? So the Superfund program is cleaning up sites where there may be these chemicals. You can't necessarily clean up to zero. It's not economically or even physically feasible. And so they weigh feasibility and economics. And they can set a level to which cleanup should occur that's above what the science found the hazard, but they need to do it knowing what the hazard is or what the risk is rather, um, associated with. And for instance, there are places in the US where arsenic is more prevalent and in Bangladesh, for instance, than what science has shown can have adverse effects. Can we clean up nature? You know, some of those questions are, are things that people really struggle with. And if you're an administrator and you know that it may be then having adverse effects, you have to do your best to limit exposure in order to limit that risk. Did you read a half one? I was going to ask you again what year you graduated with your PhD? Five years ago. Okay. So 2009. Five, five years ago. Wow. Are you just a lucky man, or is there some? What would you describe as your your rather meteor? I, I, I don't think I can say the adjective correct or the adverb. Right. But your you you managed to do a lot of things in five years. I have been incredibly fortunate. Is it just luck? No. Okay. <laughs> what I it is that either, but. is the opportunities. Yes, I've been at the right place in the right time for many of these positions or opportunities that arise, but I'm also prepared to take advantage of those opportunities when they do arise. I would suggest to all of you, don't be afraid to take risks if it's calculated risk. Don't take risk for sake of taking risks. Make sure it's a calculated risk. And uh, I was, I've been talking to a bunch of people about many of these things during the day today, and, and one of the ones that came up, and I can't remember the exact quote of Christopher Robin to Winnie the Pooh, but you're, you're <laughs> smarter than you think you are, and you uh, believe that you're um, able, and, and you're going to surprise yourself, because you really are. And uh, keep in mind that the University of Michigan, you're surrounded by really, really smart people every day. And so if you're, you know, having that second guessing yourself, it's because everybody here is really, really, really smart. And so when you get out into the world, having that Michigan degree is recognized worldwide. You know, this isn't, you know, a, a two-year program in TV VCR repair. You know? <laughs> You're going out as an expert already, and people are going to look at you as an expert in your field. So, so by all means, be in a position to be able to take advantage of those opportunities when something comes along and it's a little scary, like taking a job with Linda Birnbaum, who you know, has a certain aura, if you will, <laughs> and uh, in a, a position that you even yourself feel is a little bit maybe above your pay grade right now. And you know, say, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to do the best I can, and we'll see how it, how it turns out. You know, move to North Carolina, you know, with no real understanding of how it's going to, to roll out, and no real, I knew part of what the job would entail, but really I'm just jumping in with both feet. Uh, so my five-year plan did not include being <laughs> 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 at one of the institutes of the NIH. Um, that would have been a little ambitious. But be ready to take those opportunities, because, I mean, you're all, you're all really talented. So one thing I, so I have to give a lot of lectures on mentoring, because some of you know that we have a here and there. And so one of the things you all might remember if you've been in one of my classes is that a job of a mentor is to help you estimate the risk and take calculated risk. So would you say that you mentioned mentors all along the way and yet you seem to have made some good decisions? And I made those decisions with the help of those mentors. I mean, before I go and take a job with 
anyone. I'm calling the people, not just who have been their boss, but also have worked for them. Finding out what type of person they are. Finding out, you know, these are the things you learn by experience. And you really want to know a little bit more about what you're getting into before you commit to it. It's, it's checking the pool before you dive in. <laughs> And, uh, you know, make sure the number on the side says, you know, eight feet, or no, three feet, you know. Um, so, so really, just go, uh, if you have any additional questions, you're always welcome to contact me. I, I have a few business cards left today, if you'd like one after this, if you want to be able to talk through your, your particular situation. Um, it's, it's kind of a whirlwind here, what I was able to give, and there was way more information that I would like to be able to share than I had an opportunity to today. Uh, do you have any advice for, let's say, PhD candidates here considering postdoc opportunities in government? Particularly, I know um, the EPA right now, they have postdoc opportunities available. Yeah. But actual permanent positions are limited, given the A lot of people that I know have been able to turn postdoc. The government likes good people. And if you come in as a postdoc and you do a good job, they may not be able to, but they're going to do everything they can. Um, you know, they're going to try to figure out ways to get you funded, to get you a full-time FDE. Um, yeah, everything still has to go through USA Jobs. Everything still has to go through the appropriate channels. But they're going to make sure you know about it. They're going to make sure that you've already shown them the skill set that they need. If you're there doing a good job, now they're creating a position that they're thinking about the things you can do well as when her postdoc's up, what are we going to have a hold of? Who do you think is a great, great person to fill that job? You've already shown them what they need. You've made yourself indispensable. And that, that goes a long way. You know, it's, it's not per se selling the job or setting the job just for you, by no means. But what it is doing is you're putting in that manager's mind what it is that they want because they've already seen you do it. Okay. <laughs>